open up your mouth and just, just speak a praise right now. Come on, give him your hallelujah this morning. Give him your hallelujah. Give him your hallelujah. Come on, give him your hallelujah. moment like this. So you just close your eyes. Don't miss this moment. Don't miss this moment. Don't miss this moment.
our hearts, Holy Spirit, in only the way you can. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Come on, you put your hands together. Scripture is read in your hearing already, so I want to just read verse 26, and it says, this is Acts chapter 16, verse 26, suddenly there was a great earthquake, so powerful that the very foundations of the prison were shaken, and at once all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. I want to talk again from the theme, the shakeup. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. The shakeup. The text suggests that while they were in the midst of a worshipful moment, that something happened whether it be supernaturally or naturally, it was experienced in the natural. So whether its origins start in the spiritual or in the natural, there's a synchronicity between the prayer and the praise and the earthquake. Somehow they all come together in that moment synchronistically. There's a shakeup, and a lot happens from that shakeup. But you ought to realize something: that when shakeups happen, and they happen in our lives, sometimes they are natural, sometimes they are spiritual. Sometimes we actually can be the precipitating factor for shakeups. Sometimes we get to the place where stuff happens where we really do contribute because this shakeup follows another shakeup that happens in the chapter prior to this section because something goes on and life gets upsetting because if you read the text close enough, what precedes their getting thrown in jail is that there is a woman who has a demonic spirit, a girl, who is following them. And she's following them, and although she is speaking truth, she aggravates the stupid stuffing out of them. She aggravates them. And in that moment, while they've been around preaching and teaching, in that moment, Paul is ticked. And his balance is off. And he goes Now, we can spiritualize this if you want, but the text does not try to overly spiritualize what happened. Paul momentarily got PO'd. And such to the point that he is out of balance. And I want to suggest to you that whenever radical changes occur, our lives are thrown out of balance. Have you ever been thrown out of balance? Got cut off by a car? Got cussed out for something you didn't do? 
got blamed for something that you had no part in. Someone didn't do what they said they were going to do on a timely manner when you needed it done and now you are totally Shook up, shook up, shook up. You call for service, call the insurance company, trying to get a human being on the line and get tossed back and forth between one operator to the next and each ask the same set of questions that take all your life's information over again. You done gave out your social security number so many times, you don't know who got it. Now you are out of balance. You just got news of something that you, that hurt your heart. Death of a loved one, a diagnosis, a new prognosis about your own future. And you're out of balance. I, I want to suggest as I, as I preach this shake up here that the restoration of balance is the key to overcoming the shaken experience. That you have to get your balance back to overcome when you have had a shaken experience. Because you and I know you're off. Here, here's something implicit in the text and it's obvious but it needs to be said and I will say it repeatedly the apostle overcame his experience through prayer and praise come on here they, they, the girl done upset him I'll come back to her in a minute now, now, the text says that she is following them through the city day after day, crying out, talking about these men are men of God, they're preaching the truth, but, but it's aggravating them. And then after he rebukes the spirit in her, they take it before the magistrates and then they beat them for no reason. I'd be pretty upset too. I think that if life beats you down, you have to at some point admit to yourself that you're not yourself. The lie you keep telling yourself that you're okay when you're not okay is keeping you from getting help to be okay. And there is a difference between self-encouragement and the Davidic prayer of encouraging oneself and fooling yourself. Uh, I, I wish, wish Miss Denham was here right now. Deacon S. Daniel would, would use something like this from down yonder. She'd say, she fools herself. Let me help you again. When they went in prison, locked up, in, in, in irons, at that point, they had been beaten and unattended to. No medical help. Nobody washed their wounds. Nobody made sure their head was all right. Nobody gave them two towels on a glass of water. Probably sitting there with a headache. Haven't had no food, blood sugar level off. <laughs> Listen, best as deacon that's, they didn't nobody gave them a glass of water. They was fasting, didn't an unintended fast. <laughs> At some point. You have to find a way to come back to yourself. 
And I want to suggest again that prayer and praise restored his balance and allowed him to focus beyond the self. Because until he got himself back together, he couldn't see anything but blood in his eyes. Many men wish death on me. Blood in my eye, dog, and I can't see. I'm trying to see what I'm destined to be. Many men wish death on me. I don't got no more. There comes a time when the blood in your eyes keep you from seeing other people. See, I, you, you, you missed you miss that gospel according to 50s. Listen, you, 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 you missed it because what you don't realize is that life can put you in such a place where the only thing you can see is what you have been through and not ever be able to see what others are going through around you. Don't think they didn't have a reason to be upset. You got upset with that woman? The text says, Paul, I'm in verse 18. This is in your Bible. It said, Paul, being greatly annoyed and worn out, turned up. Oh, I added the up. <laughs> the, the, that text said, the text, listen, can I help somebody here? There are things that can make you turn up. I'm going to preach it anyhow. There are things that can make you turn up. Paul was annoyed and ultimately provoked by the cry of the girl. No, 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 no. Are y'all following me in the sound room? He was, he was annoyed and, and he was provoked by her. Now, now the reason I'm, 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 I'm saying this is because if you think about it, when Paul turned around to the girl, the text says Paul looked at the spirit and said, Thou foul spirit, that's my version of it, come out of her. Now, come here real quick because you need to understand something. He didn't look at her with loving eyes and say, you've been suffering with a demon. You've been going through something and I'm going to relieve that spirit off your life. I know you're trying to say something good about me, but that's an evil spirit, baby, and I'm about to help you get delivered. No, he was annoyed. And there's a difference between ministering annoyed and ministering under the anointing. I know I'm preaching today. He was annoyed. And I know when he got to himself a few minutes later, he said, I, I should have did that. She, she needed to be delivered because if I had called this out in the name of Jesus and it was not supposed to happen, it wouldn't have happened. But I wish I had been in a better place when I did it. I wish I had been in a better mindset. She needed a deliverance, but she didn't need it from an annoyed preacher. And I want to tell somebody here, you can bless people in life. And do it in such a manner that even your blessing does not feel like a blessing to them. Y'all yeah. working with me here? I'm, I'm, I'm going to get it. Listen, listen. But Paul, after being annoyed, after being beaten, after being thrown in prison, finds a way. And I want to suggest to you again, and I'm going to do the first two real quick because I did them last week, how you handle your shake experience. 
says more about you than anything else. It says more about you than anything else. I, it says something about you. What, what are you going to do when, when life shakes you up? Let, no, no, let me say it another way. You see, you've been saved a long time. What are you going to do when you, he didn't really sin, but he could have been better. He could have been a better human being. What do you do? How do you get yourself back to who you really want to be? You're, no, I put it like this. How do you get back to your best self? The best version of you. Okay, I got I to hurry. I got to hurry. I, I want to suggest to you three, three things, and then under the third one, I've got a whole thing, a set of factors I want to raise. First of which, I want to suggest to you that the shakeup was not to hurt them, but to open a door for them. That's the first one. So, so, that, so that when the earth shook, God was not trying to swallow them up. God was not trying to scare them, but he was opening up a door for them. And I want to suggest this to you that things in life can happen to you whether natural or spiritual, that are not necessarily always evil. Stuff happens. Sometimes it's just happened. Sometimes the tree just fell and there wasn't no demon up there cutting down tree limbs. The devil was not in the wind, it just fell. The shakeup was not to hurt them, only to open the door for them. The second one I spoke to last week. The shakeup was not hazardous, but was an opportunity for deliverance. So the ground shook. Their, their, their bonds broke free. They, was, they, were, they were in the prison without any chains on them. The door flew open, but it was an opportunity for deliverance. Not their deliverance, rather the jailer's deliverance. Not, not, not just to let them out, but to let him come in. Ooh, come on here. Come on. Listen, listen, listen. The third one is that the shakeup was not a hindrance, but an obligation for duty. Reverend, what are you talking about? You see, what you have to realize is when the shakeup happened, there came before them a great opportunity to be their best selves. And because of what they had been doing, they were able to be their best selves. Okay, I know it's still not making sense yet. Let me see if I can clarify. The shake was a manifestation of devotion, praise heard both in heaven and on the earth. So while they were singing and praying, the Bible says that the other prisoners heard them and God heard them. So that the shake is a manifestation. And if that's the case, what was happening to them was the lesson I've been trying to tell you is that prayer and praise restored his balance in preparation for the next move of God. Don't miss that, don't miss that, don't miss that. You see, when they started praying and praising, they came back to their best selves, the best saints they could be, the best apostles they could be, the best Christians they could be, the best people of the way they could be. And when they got to that point, God said, now you're prepared for my next move because my next move is going to be great. But I couldn't use you annoyed. I needed to use you anointed. Because when you're annoyed, you can cast out devils. But it's 
hard to love people. Annoyed, you can still activate the anointing, but it's hard for you to love others. So, 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 stay with me. Uh -huh. God said, I'm going to give you a chance now. I'm going to give you a chance. Lord, what do you give me a chance for? What's the next move? He said, um, I'm going to give you a chance to demonstrate profound humanity. Whew. What do you mean, Reverend? Well, let, let's, let's look at the text. Uh, Elder Red read it so ably this morning. The text suggests that when the ground shook, shackles fell off, door opened up, and the jailer pulled out his, his sword and got ready to commit suicide. And with that suicidal ideation about to be acted upon, Paul calls out and says, don't do that. Now, 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 wait a minute, before I get this whole point out, notice something, I need, need to make note of something. Notice now, there's no light inside of the prison section they're in. They're in a section without light. He, he can't see Paul. And Paul can't see him. And you have to remember now, he's probably got his sword in a leather sheath. So it's not like Paul could hear the grinding of metal against metal pulling out the sword. But the inner light in Paul was so attuned to the inner being in another man that he could interpret what would go down in his spirit because of an unnecessary pain which was invoked by an unreasonable and yet reasonable fear. Because if I let them go, I'm going to be killed anywhere. I might as well kill myself. And Paul intuits his next action and says, stop. Let me help you something. When you get to your best self, you develop love's capacity. Oh, Reverend, what do you mean? You see, when you're your best self, you don't just think about yourself. We could just run away now, hit him upside the head and get out of here. Instead, you start thinking about the humanity of this other person. I don't want you hurting yourself. Your family needs you. There's somebody that loves you somewhere else. I got enough love for you and me. I know you're my jailer and you're not my best friend. You're not my cut buddy. You're not in my clique. You're not in my clan. You don't look like me. I don't even know your orientation. But whoever you are, you're another human being. So as far as I'm concerned, your life matters as much as mine. Please don't touch yourself on my behalf because I care about you. My love can Capacity is greater when I'm my best self. And what's wrong with most Christians and the reason why we spend so much time trying to judge who God's going to put in heaven and not put in heaven is because we're not our best self. So our love capacity is diminished and all we think about is our own selfish motives and beliefs and ideologies and they supersede the very thing that Jesus said made you a disciple by this shall you know that you are my disciples that you have loved one for another I think that I, I'm, I'm just talking I'm just talking I'm just talking. Yeah, but I think that the love capacity that, that, that Christians sometimes fail to exhibit is a great sign of their imbalance where they love themselves more than they love the brethren that no 
nobody counts but me and mine. I told y'all about that sign. It says, love everybody and let God sort it out. I don't have to pick and choose. He was able to discriminate, to, to demonstrate profound humanity at, and he shows love. He says, no, don't, don't touch yourself. And then notice the jailer says, go get, go get light, get a torch, get a torch. Come over here. They bring light in. And, and what happens? Because he is able to demonstrate his love and his capacity, the jailer comes in and gets at his feet and said, what must I do to be saved? Well, how can I save myself? How, how can I, how can I, let me tell you something. You want to help God's work expand on the earth. You love folk enough till they're ready to get saved. <laughs> quit rapping, quit rapping. Listen, you see, what he does is he says, well, y'all, come, get up, get up, come on, come on. Come, come with me. What happens in that next moment moves beyond love's capacity into life changing. Because Paul begins to minister to them. And he begins to share the gospel with him. And then not only does he share it with him, but it's so greatly shared that it goes to his household. Because, see, I need to bring you home and tell my family about what's going on here because this is too big for just me. This is greater than me. And like Lydia up in the beginning of the chapter who, who went upon her salvation as Paul enters her house, salvation enters her house, now salvation enters into this soldier's house. It enters into this jailer's house and this jailer now is being taught the word of life and his entire family. Is ready for baptism. Life changing. Can, can I help you again? This is my C underneath this point. Because what this tells you is this is limit challenging. Because see, what you need to realize is you do not have to open doors for yourself when God is on your side. You don't have to always be the one to fix it. Guess what you do first? Fix you. And let God fix it. Y'all missed it, went over your head. Some of y'all ain't got it yet, so I'm going to have to do it again. They didn't, they didn't start preaching until after they finished prayer and praise. Okay, wait a minute, Reverend. what do you mean? I mean, until they came back to themselves, God, I bless your name. God, I love you. God, I worship you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm going to sit in your presence, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Mama, 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 mama. Presence, God. Now they're praying and praising, and then all of a sudden the ground moves, and there is this ministry opportunity sitting right in front of them that they would not have had if they hadn't brought themselves into a place with God first. I want to help somebody right now. You see, you're so busy trying to fix things outside of you that the one thing that needs the greatest fixing, you forget about, and that's you. They pause long enough. I don't know how long they have been singing and praying. But I do know this much, 
the text said it got to be midnight. Which means that at some point it turned from p.m. to a.m. At 12.59.9, when, when it was over, the new day was dawning. And they were in a new place. And I want to suggest this to you. You have the capacity, wherever you are, at any time, to change your situation by changing you. Okay. I talked about taking the pause. I'm going to say it again. You go back and hear my teaching on, on this later, uh, later on, but I tell people, you need to know the right time to pause. Because sometime before you speak, because if you speak out of your flesh, you're going to hurt somebody. You speak out of your flesh, your, your anointedness might take over. But if you can get to your inner being and allow your spirit to influence your soul so that your soul is drenched in the spirit presence of God, you will speak and act completely Come on, I gotta close, I gotta close. I know I've been, can, can I tell you what happens? I'm, I'm gonna close this out for now. I'll be back, watch this. I'll be back, I'm over time already. Listen, what you need to recognize is this. When they began to preach that household, that household received the Lord. But what happens next, it blows my mind. The jailer takes them in and begins to dress the wounds that they had and help them to clean up and then put a meal in front of them. Y'all missed it. Let me tell you something. When you return to yourself and you give out of your best self inner being, all of your needs are going to be met. Jesus didn't say, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all of his righteousness and everything else might be added. He said it will be added unto you. In other words, as I walk in righteousness, rightness, I call rightness from across the universe to align with my life. And God is going to bless me. I don't care if you don't like me. I don't care if you don't like you. Mr. <laughs> I don't like him. He too big. I don't like him. I don't like him. Guess what? Guess what? If I live right and if my spirit aligns with the very call of God and the presence of God within me and I then take on the obligation of loving to the highest capacity of my very being and being a demonstration of divine love in the earth realm. If I take on the role of Jesus that calls in people that others would reject. If I gather people around me that others would not want to. If I call the Zacchaeuses down from the tree. If I go to the well and I talk to the woman who's had too many husbands. If I go to the publican and sinner and walk alongside of them. If I take a woman who comes to me who shouldn't be in public but grabs the hem of my garment with a hemorrhaging body and I heal her. If I walk around to the blind and help to open their eyes. If I feed the hungry when they're standing around. If I go down and clothe the naked. It won't matter whether you like me or not. The Lord will demonstrate his power and his anointing and he'll bless you because when you do what God asks of you to do, your righteousness makes 
and God will bless you in the earth realm. All things will be added to you and nothing shall be impossible to you because you believed. Come on, give God a praise. Come on, give him a praise. I'm out of time, but I'm not out of word. I'm trying to take you down a road of a lesson that I know God wants you to have. Because I believe this is the season where the saints must come into love and our love capacity must expand. And I want to just tell everyone this, you don't get to decide who to love. Just love everybody. Just love everybody. Yeah, and it'll take strength to love, but it's worth every ounce of energy to love like God would love. And then you'll see the anointing of God demonstrated in your life in ways you never could imagine you'll see the anointing demonstrated. I'm not finished with this text yet. I, I, I promise you I'll, I'll get it done. As the, as the band is now playing hallelujah, I want to extend an invitation. Maybe there's somebody, whether here or online, who would like to give their heart to the Lord or who would like to become a part of the Shiloh Church family. If you're here, I only ask if you just lift your hand and one of the ushers will come and give you some information and we'll talk to you immediately after worship. If you're online, I ask that you email me. I ask you call me. Get in touch with us. Say, I want to be a part of that ministry. God bless you, my brother. Amen. I should make sure you get his, get his information. Anyone else, I extend an invitation to you. I love you now with the love of the Lord. Hallelujah. That's what I want right there. Hallelujah. 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 Life can, can make you feel as though you're going to blow up. You, you start hyperventilating, breathing real fast. But I want to tell you that if I can get you to breathe and I can get you to pause long enough to pray, that I can get you back to center. No matter what life has just thrown at you. I got to get you to breathe though. I got to get you to pause. I got to get you to pray. You don't necessarily have to be able to sing. But I just need you to get time to allow your mind and spirit to align. Because God, who rests at the center of your being, is always available and waiting for you to act upon his love and to live in it. So Father, I thank you for these people who are here and I thank you for those who are watching me online. Lord, today I pray that this word will speak to them afresh. I pray it opens up the mind's eye that they may see you in a fresh new way. Father, I know that this text has been rich for the body of Christ for years. I pray that this fresh look at this word will resonate deeply with the saints where we'll find a way to love even better to help lives to change 
and take the limits off of what you can do because you can do great and marvelous things. Touch us now in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the sanctuary. Come on. Hallelujah. If I can get you to take a moment, just sing with me. Hallelujah. Hey, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh. your love gifts together, your tithes, your offering. Some of you have committed to the seed campaign. And of course, you know, we haven't really been gathering. It's only our second time gathering. I want you to get your seed gifts out. Make sure you get, you keep your commitment. Whatever you can do to help sustain the church and ministry during this season, you do it to the best of your capacity. You know, the tithe belongs to the Lord. Whatever your gift is, you give it to the best of your capacity. And we're going to keep doing what we do. We keep giving to, to projects and programs and people because that's who we are. Online or in the saints, we can give by Givelify, by Cash App, or by mail. If you're in the sanctuary and you want to give, there's ushers at the door. You can just drop it in the bucket. I don't want to have to ever go back to making a big emphasis on giving. What I pray is that all of us will just do what we know we can do and we will honor God with our giving. We'll honor God. We'll just honor God. God, I love you. I honor you. My wife and I, we walked in this morning. We had our tithing envelope ready. My wife handed it to me. I handed it to the treasurer. I, we just, God, we honor you. Here it is. You don't have to ask me for it. I know it's mine to, and I'm obligated to give it. I'm obligated to give it not just because I'm here that Sunday, but the Sundays when I can't make it to the sanctuary. I'm still obligated to you because I love you. I don't give because I'm in the building. I give because I love you. And I give because you bless me. The building only enhances my experience with you. God bless you. Would you, would you please pray with me with all the offering? God, we thank you for offering the gift and the giver. Those who are giving online, those who are giving in the sanctuary, bless your people even now as we give unto the kingdom of the living God. In Jesus' name, amen.